so that's uh, to help everyone keep track of how we're navigating. There's been uh, our water bill is S96, and but there's been a major proposal under discussion. We've had different drafts of it. People from inside and outside the committee have been working on it, and. Um, and in response to a lot of committee discussion with all the lawyers and the partners in the last three weeks, um, ANR came back with uh, significant modifications to the proposal around the Clean Water Utility. I asked Michael to take the revised prompts, so, and weave them into a new draft. So that's what we have in front of us today. So you don't want to do 40, you have 49 at 9? 49. Oh, 49, I'm sorry. Did you, yeah. you, you jumped ahead. Yeah. <coughs> all right, well, good catch. Yeah. All of it on. <laughs> in line, keep all those up. Do you have your 49? I do. So we have two drafts today, actually. Yeah, we should do one. Well, we'll do the teacher. In an hour, we're going to do the water. But for now, it's Okay, so we have the next draft, and this this draft is based on our community discussion last night. So. Right, so do you have draft 1.2, February 21st, 1.40 p.m.? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm just, just going to step through the changes that you requested. Um, on page 1, lines 12 and 13, there was some concern that the findings were too narrow uh, regarding how PFAS entered the environment. So it now says PFAS may enter the environment from numerous industrial or commercial sources, including when emitted during manufacturing from disposal or from leachate. Should I move on? Yes, please. Page one, line 18, there had been a subdivision, uh, an entire finding regarding that there was more research needed to determine the health effects on humans of PFAS. There was testimony that the um, there is research about what the health effects are and that that entire subdivision was not necessary. It was deleted. The remaining subdivisions were renumbered. On page two, line eight, this uh, uh, subdivision seven, as it's numbered now, had an introductory paragraph regarding uh, to adopt a precautionary principle. Um, some of the interested parties said that should be deleted, um, and that was deleted. Moving on to page three, lines 13 through 19. This is in the section on uh, public water systems testing for PFAS, the five PFAS, known the five specified. PFAS contaminants um, until ANR adopts a MCL by rule. Uh, on page three, line 13, subsection C, this was the subsection regarding what the water system needed to do if they determined that the um, PFAS individually or in combination exceeded 20 parts per trillion. The previous language had the system notifying ANR and then ANR directing the system to implement treatment. Uh, ANR just said, let's take out the notification requirement. ANR will just direct them to do it. Uh, that was long winded. I apologize. Page three, line 20, subsection D. This was the subsection regarding providing. Um, alternative sources of potable water while treatment was ongoing for the PFAS. Uh, there was some concern that it was ambiguous as to when treatment would end. The language did, I admit, read like the alternative sources were to be provided while all treatment was ongoing. Uh, so to narrow it, it now says during the period of treatment for implementation of another remedy uh, to reduce PFAS in the drinking water. Um, the, the public water system shall provide potable water through other means to all customers. Then a new sec sentence is added. The requirement for a public water system to provide potable water to customers and users of the system through other means shall cease when monitoring results indicate the levels of PFAS um, are below the health advisory level. Just to that, Frank, uh, what happened down 
Is that in while they were sorting things out and they're uh, supplying bottled water to everyone? Should I move on? Uh, no questions. Yes, please. <clears throat> On page 6, line 16 in section 5 regarding adoption of the Vermont Water Quality Standard, you wanted the date changed from 2024 to 2022, by which time the agency shall file a final rule to adopt the surface water quality standards for, at a minimum, the five PFAS contaminants. On page 7, line 10 through 12, in that authority um, for investigation of potential sources of, of PFAS contamination, there had been a subsection that had been deleted from the original language, um, and you wanted that returned. And it provides that on or before July 1, 2020, all public water systems shall conduct monitoring for the maximum number of PFAS detectable from standard laboratory methods or list of specific PFAS. And I think that was to capture the notion that one, it's an investigation, and so we're progressively seeking information. And if the science keeps changing, we don't want to tie ourselves to the current list of five when 18 months from now the list is 25 or whatever it is. Uh, moving down, Pete, 7, line 13, section 7. Uh, this was that authority that had previously been in session law where the secretary could require any person discharging, emitting, et cetera, et cetera, to conduct monitoring for any constituent for which the Department of Health has issued an advisory level. Uh, I recommended that it seemed to be ongoing authority, that it should be put in statute. Because it is comprehensive, meaning it applies to all agency programs, it's not just within one program. I thought it needed to go in, in one of two places, either the Secretary's general authority in Title III or an enforcement authority in Title X, Chapter 201. I didn't really think of this much as enforcement, so I put it in general authority, but if the agency thinks it's better in enforcement, I think it could go there as well. So we'll check in with parties uh, around the room after we finish the walk. Um, on page eight, uh, there was some session law language in the previous draft that related to that authority for the agency to require uh, any emitter, discharge, et cetera, to do monitoring for a health advisory constituent. Uh, I think that should stay as session law, and that is what section eight is. Uh, the highlighted language on line six and seven is really um, just changing uh, a reference. Previously, I had just referenced subsection A. Well, subsection A is now that codified law in Title III, um, and so I'm just referencing that on page eight, line six and seven. And those are the changes. Okay. And when we do the phrase on line seven, page eight, and interim environment of the standards, we're talking about addressing surface waters, right? No, we we're talking on page seven, line 14, the authority given to the secretary. It's that two-year authority to require monitoring for any constituent for which a health advisor. That's the interim. Okay. But on page eight, line seven, the reference there to interim, uh, sorry, environmental media standards, those are for the realm of surface water? No, it's for everything under, see, it's referencing back to 3 VSA 2810. Yep. So it's all of that authority. It's not just surface oh, waters and it's not just PFAS. It could be a, a, a discharge emission or release. Yep. So emission is generally in Vermont. Uh, an air emission, um, and it's for any constituent where there's a health advisory level. Thank you. If the, uh, what is in place if the administration doesn't meet the deadline set for rulemaking? The 2022? Well, I think you're well aware that there's often not, no consequence or little consequence. I'm not, I'm not worried about 
punishing someone for not meeting the deadline, okay. what is the level of protection that's in place in the absence of a timely establishment of the rule? For the water quality standards, there really would not be one. Um, for drinking water, I think you're going to have the interim protection, which will extend until ANR adopts the MCL by rule, because you have a contingent repeal. But that interim standard remains in effect until ANR adopts. And that's clear. Yes, there's in on uh, section four, I think it is. No, I, I'm just, you say it's clear. Yep, that, clear. That's, I will accept that. Yeah. yeah. The interim drinking water monitoring for PFAS contaminants shall be repealed on the effective date of the rules required under Section 3, and those rules are the MCL for PFAS. Is there a standard in place during the monitoring period that is as the force of something law or requires something? Or? It has the force of law, yes. Actually, you know what? Is that an action required? That's a really good point. Um, I think in section <coughs> two, uh, I think that you could say that section two is enforceable by the agency under 10 GSA chapter 201, uh, because otherwise. I never, never land. Yeah, I think that that's a very good point. Um, so so, yep. uh, I have a question. Yeah, if you can mark that addition and we'll go back and discuss it before saying that things are like negative on the first time. What did you say, Mike? Like <coughs> uh, so um, on Section 9, um, the contaminant pilot project uh, leachate out of um, uh, out of landfills, can you explain to me wh where this changes? Because I'm under the understanding that with their with their conditional permit that they have to make certain reports, but is that not the case or so I can tell you where this came from. There was actually a bill in the house where the the sponsor um, uh, wanted to 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 review whether or not um, basically landfill leachate should be processed at the Newport wastewater treatment facility. And in discussing that with the agency, the agency said, well, there's already a permit condition for the landfill to be doing this evaluation that's referenced there. Why don't we report back to you on the results of that evaluation, our assessment of it, and the agency's recommendations regarding okay. that. So we're not, we're not changing any practice, sir? I, it's, instead of just reporting it to legislature, it's the right, agency. right, it's, and and it's not even that the that the the permitted entity is reporting. It's A and R is looking at the evaluation, which is a condition of the existing permit, and then A and R assesses and reports to you. Um, I think the concept there is the evaluation will hopefully determine what alternatives are there uh, and what treatment can be conducted, not just for that landfill um, or leachate from that landfill, but hopefully, potentially, the other, what is it, four to five other landfills in the state? So, thanks for that question. Maybe I, well, we just added this last Conditions or just to make sure that rather than us seeing a report, we get uh, state expertise evaluating the report and then giving guidance to us. And the other thing, and people are mentioning it. So, some people said, Are we <coughs> concentrating too much on just cover trains, landfill generally? So that yeah, it may be that there's an investigation going on there, but there's broader lessons for landfills wherever they are. And so we don't want to be hyper focused on, uh, on one thing. Well, and, and I just, the only other thing I point out on that piece is in the findings on number two. Are we redundant um, when we say when admitted during the manufacturing process? 
comma from the disposal of, or could we have said that comma to or the disposal of goods containing PFAS? Because we know the disposal is probably going in the landfill at some point, but I, I don't, I feel like we're double dipping or hitting that point twice and being redundant. Okay, so what's the. Uh, Just for me on number two, yeah. where it says when emitting during the manufacturing process, comma, from the disposal of goods. Contam uh, goods containing PFAS, comma, or I would almost move the or after the manufacturing process and then cross out from each of from landfills <laughs> because it's kind of given when you're already talking about the disposal of goods containing PFAS. We know they're probably ending up in a, I just feel like we're saying we're just being redundant in that sentence. But that's just a stylistic thing for me. Well, I think the you know, I think the part of the reason it's in there is because it is uh, well, just as a matter of fact, uh, six, I think six point nine million gallons of leachate came to the Montpelier wastewater treatment right. facility. So but I, I but I feel like we're putting the blame for PFAS on the landfill in that situation when it's from the manufacturing of the material that just gets used in the process. I mean, we have to dispose of these products. We allow them to be manufactured, we have to dispose of them. It's not, to my mind, on this one, the landfill has, they're kind of stuck with whatever gets thrown away from consumer products. I, I just think it makes sense more to focus on the manufacturing of it and the disposal of those goods. Yeah, but this is a, the major flow of PFAS right. through the environment, so I get it. And from the very beginning, I, think, I appreciate your point. I think I've said many times, this isn't about finger pointing. Right. What goes to Coventry is originating largely with every one of us throughout the state. It's our garbage that goes there. There's a consequence and it flows back into the environment in different ways. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping people are feeling like we're being very even handed. We're trying to name the major you know, emissions from commercial industrial sources, manufacturing, uh, Goods that are imported to the state that contain PFAS, and then there's that flow out of uh, leachate from landfills. So I think we're being even handed about, or just explicit about what the major elements are. Okay. Um, any one thing I wanted to flag, and we can discuss it, and we'll hear from others, is on page three. Um, lines 9 to 12 on the monitoring. Um, having heard a little from, uh, albeit secondhand, from uh, Mr. Weinberg in Rutland, I checked in with BBC about the possibility of revising that uh, monitoring schedule. And, and so let me just float out the notion we'll check in with BC on this. So if you get a, um, a negative test, that you might go to a slower interval. And for instance, if everyone's tested by September 1st, it turns out if you come up negative, that maybe your retest, if you had a negative, would be uh, at a longer cycle. And ask BC to recommend something. Um, maybe it's two years. Or other than six months. I think Mr. Weinberg's concern was if you're negative, why run through a panel six months later and six months later and six months later? So, uh, but we have more to learn. Maybe, it, I don't know that we're creating that many more exposures in that kind of six month time frame. So just fly is there back. a big cost to it? Is this, is, is, I mean. Well, so that's something for us to learn more. What's the cost? Um, <laughs> I appreciate that at this point we're, we're also doubling down. There's like this investigation period. We're trying to learn things more quickly. We don't want to ask on the sensitive to costs in this quarter. So I flag that for myself. Um, OK. So uh, if there are any other questions for Mr. Grady, I'm going to ask Mr. Chapman to join us at the table and talk about the next draft. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming back.
<laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I know you had a great visit last time. I wasn't sure if you were coming back. Uh, okay. All right. So for the record, Matt Chapman, General Counsel, Agency of National Resources. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to pick up just on the last topic with respect to the frequency of monitoring it at uh, drinking water supplies. It, it would be for this type of contaminant atypical to be on a frequency of six months unless you found it there. Uh -huh. um, you know, normally my understanding for what I would call sort of like the industrial chemical suite that you and the, and the toxics that you wouldn't expect to sort of regularly occur. I mean, there are things like lead copper, disinfectant byproducts that, that could happen within a water system that you want to have fairly regular monitoring over. Mm -hmm. I don't think PFAS is going to be one of those things. I think you're going to basically either, you're going to find it or you're not. And then afterwards, it's good to have it on a routine. And I, you know, I was telling the chair earlier this morning, I mean, I think that we were certainly talking about the routine being a period of years. I mean, I, you know, two does not sound unreasonable as a, a starting point. I think the agency within two years is going to have its rule adopted and will have gone through a public process to, to talk about what the appropriate frequency is with, with water system operators and advocates and others. So, so if we have everyone testing by September 1, that's test number one for everyone, and then there's a an if at that point, if we found it, do we have to, does it need to be a threshold for you know, is it, is it zero or is it a low threshold? What's the if? Uh, you know, I, I think you could say something like um, you could have them retest in accordance with um, a schedule or directives established by the secretary and then leave us to basically give directives. I mean, I think effectively what we will do is the testing will be different depending on what we see. If we see presence but not above standard, we're going to re probably require them to test more often than if someone that we see non-detects with. And if we see someone above standard, they're going to be at least at the frequency of the person who had it present but not above standard, right? So um, I, I think there may be some variability in how we look at this depending on the concentrations that we're seeing and, and frankly also potential source areas that may be around like uh, that, that may be at risk to the system. Um, so some flexibility, I, again, I think these are all things that we're gonna address in the context of the rulemaking process. Um, Do we have them in time? That's my, my question. Should we establish a default for the time being? I mean, I think having a test in septem by September 1, 19 is not unreasonable. Um, I think that, that any resampling after that um, you know, I'm uh, certainly I, I'm hopeful that by yeah. You know, I let me actually look and see what we said that the rule needed to be adopted by February 20. Um, so according to the schedule that's in here, we six would six months would roll around by February 20. We see that second six months. That is accurate. Um, that being said, I mean that's so I. <laughs> But, and so that the basic structure though you're talking about is everyone's up on the first, and then if you're greater than standard, you're going to be on the six month interval for sh for sure. It, uh, yeah. If you're less than standard, you want to detect, you're going to be on a longer schedule, and if you're not detecting, you're going to be on a different schedule still. I believe that's accurate, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, one comment, and uh, you know, with respect to subsection C in this section, um, it says um, with res if monitoring results indicate the presence, mm -hmm. um, I would I would say that if monitoring results confirm an exceedance of the standard. Um, then we direct, right? I mean, again, I think the importance is it's two parts. One is it's important to ensure that it's it's exceeding the standard, and then it's confirmatory, just because of the nature of, I mean, sir, you understand, we see false positives a lot, and we resample to make sure that we didn't have an issue with the sampling when this happens. And, you know, I think it's gonna be, 
an even larger problem with water systems, especially if they're doing the testing and the state's not doing the testing. So we just want to make sure that we actually have a problem before we tell people that they need to spend a couple million dollars on treatment systems. So would you repeat that language again? That you were um, something to the effect of uh, if monitoring results under this section confirm uh, an exceedance of uh, the Vermont Health Advisory level of 20 parts per trillion, the agency shall direct. So something to, to that, and I'm sure Mike can you know, work on the language or have to help work on the language. But it's, it's really, I think, the important part for the agency is making sure that it's com a confirmed. Um, does it just work to replace indicators with confirms? Monitoring results on sub subsection B confirms the presence of any people. I think that probably would work, Mike. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Any other questions? Um, you know, I guess. Yeah, I'm not going to be an old, old saw, I mean, but the 2022 date with respect to the water quality standards, if the agency continues to have concerns with that particular date. Um, and, and the other thing I guess I would, I would mention with respect to... Can I just comment on that one again? By the way, uh, this may be less reassuring for you to hear than for, for me to say, but I think the, the committee was interested in seeing uh, as rapid a progress as possible. If it turns out that it's not practical, we're given the resources, then we would ask to be told what it would cost to flip the bill. For sure, I mean that progress. So I think, Senator, with respect to subsection A, the agency's heard um, the committee's concern and will likely come back to you with what we think we can do. You know. Um, what the region is willing to do and, and sort of work collaboratively to do and what that would cost. And if the state wants to do something on an expedited schedule like this, and what level of resources the state would need to expend in order to get there. Um, so. Right. I mean, um, I think the, the next comment is on the following section, section six, um, and it's, it's with respect to going back to this total oxidizable PFAS concentration. Um, the agency had the opportunity to talk with the person who developed this test, who actually is the, the one who... Sorry, sure, this is lines, this is page seven, lines uh, six through nine. Um, I think the hope here is um, not to use this test to evaluate a representative portion of the public water systems, but rather to um, study the use of this test as a part of the investigation. This test. So when we talked to the person who actually designed the test, she said, this is not intended to be used for public water systems. She would never use it on a drinking water source. That it's intended to be used when you find something through your sort of standard testing methodologies. That you, it's in, you, you, it is highly unlikely that you are going to find um, anything through this top assay test if you don't find anything through standard methodology. So again, what this is intended to do is when you see something, um, as far as these breakdown products um, with respect to PFAS, you're looking to see how many precursor products are out there and how you're going to basically base your treatment. And that's what this test was designed to do. Um, we're trying to use it in a way that is different than how it was designed. And I don't think the agency is opposed to looking at that in sort of let's call it a research type setting as opposed to an applied science type setting. I think that we're not, we're not prepared to say, let's just go out and test um, a representative portion of water systems and see what we get. Because I think based on our conversations, we're not going to get useful data and it's going to be a fairly expensive exercise. Um, 
and for context, um, running one uh, 537 for PFOS costs in the range of $1,000. So it's to basically collect the test and run it through the analyticals and get the reporting back. Um, we're expecting that this is going to be somewhere in the, the $1,300 to $1,500, $1,600 per sample. And there's over 1,000 water systems. So to try and do something representative, it's not going to be an insignificant cost to do this. So again, you want? I think that it. I well, ideally, I think that, and I'll work. I'm happy to work on some language. I don't. But basically, rather than saying as a part of the investigation, the secretary shall evaluate a representative portion, mm -hmm. saying something like, as a part of the, the investigation, the secretary shall evaluate the utility of using total oxidizable PFAS testing for public water systems, or something to that effect. Um, so that it is. So are you just trying to get to, you're trying to avoid the random testing where it's going to cost a lot of money and, <laughs> and not, not provide us any useful provide, information. Okay, that's what you're really, so you're trying to do the more targeted. Well, we're trying to, so this test was not designed to do what this legislation mm -hmm. is saying to do with it. And there's a desire to see whether it has utility in this field and what the, the extent of the utility of this methodology is. And I don't think the agency is opposed to that. I think it's, I think it's, it's the difference between trying to scope out what the utility of this methodology is versus using it in, a, in an applied setting to try and actually get information from it in a sort of applied context. That's helpful. There's the section immediately below lines 10 through 12 is this a bit of belt and suspenders from your point of view? It's because we also say the maximum number of two past potential sustained of other programs. So that's going to be like 537.1. Right. It, well, the, the section below is going to get you the between 35 and 40 PFAS compounds that currently are detectable through uh, 537. Um, not, I, I mean, I, I don't, the total oxidizable. PFAS test is a complicated test, and what it basically does is take precursor compounds and break them down into their daughter products, and you see a percent change. And you know, the, the comments that we receive from the person, the person who developed this test is because of the nature of how PFAS chemicals work sort of in an industrial setting, you're not going to see any of the parent compounds unless you see the breakdown compounds. They're just, they're not so pure that you're, you're not going to see these multiple spectrums when you're looking at them. So in other words, you're going to see something in 537. And the way this test is intended to work is once you've found PFAS there, it helps you sort of identify the buckets of how many carbons are in these other sort of parent products, and it was intended to be developed so you could then uh, refine your understanding to what treatment technologies, because how you treat for some uh, PFAS product, uh, some PFAS are different than how you treat for others. And so that was how this test is, was designed. This is intended, this is saying, use it on a cross section of potentially clean drinking water sources. We're just not, and the test was not built to do that and it may yield, it, it, this test is basically like, it forces extractions and breakdowns that will probably never occur in the environment. That's what it's built to do. Um, so we're just, we just don't, she did not recommend, in fact told us she would never use it in the context of a drinking water application. So. Thank you. Noted. Um, we'll look for more feedback and maybe a short change in the words. And then my, I think, last comment is we probably should include um, a reference <laughs> to section 2810 and 8003A in the and, and ensure that if someone either fails to monitor or fails to in, you know, comply with, that it's an enforceable offense under the Uniform Environmental Enforcement Statute. Um, 
So where's that in section seven? So that would be section seven. And it would be adding a new section to just basically extend. We have a, a sort of a applicability section and the uniform environmental law enforcement section that says here are the, the sections that are enforceable. Mm -hmm. And it would be adding this citation to that list. Any other comments that I have? That's it. Any other questions for Mr. Chapman? Mr. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I do appreciate the two of you guys going back, but no, it really is helpful, I think, to the committee. I know John, you can talk to Mary Mouse. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 so fast. <laughs> um, I will. I'll start. I'll start with um, section six A and B, and I think that um, you know we are in the process of consulting with experts related to TOPA and other methods. I think that one of the things we've talked about is that there is a rush to closed data gaps associated with analytical methods to evaluate total load, total PFAS exposure. Um, so I think that there is some disagreement in terms of where you can use it, how far away um, the, the method is to be able to use it for certain um, applications. Um, I think that we agree that you know, we there's there's not an intent to use this test method as a regulatory method, um, but as part of the investigation. Um, so I think that you know this this type of test, even though it may not, it helps you identify what the total load might be. So even though you may not, you know, if you're not if you don't expect to see any PFAS. Um, if you don't have any PFAS, you wouldn't see anything with the TOPA. If you do have PFAS in the water, you can see the potential additional load. Um, and so we still think that um, using methods that move us toward being able to better see the universe of PFAS that we may be exposed to is important. I think one of the... <coughs> You know, we would feel comfortable with language in Section A um, that would, that second to last sentence, that would basically say, as part of this investigation, uh, the Secretary shall conduct a pilot to evaluate a representative portion of public water systems for those PFAS that are not quantified by EPA certified laboratory methods using TOPA or other test methods. Um, so something along those lines, where it there, you know, we rec we we certainly don't want to ask the agency to do something that is not going to be helpful, um, but we do think it's critical that the state begins investigating to look at the total PFAS exposure that Vermonters are exposed to. So my understanding, uh, limited understanding of that total oxidizable PFAS concentration test is it, it is um, in a way going after the, uh, the unknown. Mm -hmm. the, if we have, if the known, the known PFASs are tested through um, standard laboratory methods. That's right, yeah. It's the unknown ones that we would otherwise not see, even if we're not trying to identify, we're trying to determine presence or absence. Yeah. Is that the, the distinction in your mind? I think, you know, it, in my mind, it's trying to, yes, it's trying to identify what are, what are the other PFAS that we may be exposed to that are not quantified by these, the EPA test method 537.1. So we're um, not looking for levels but we're looking for presence or action? I think that we we want to know all of that, but I, I think recognizing that, you know, we are, um, you know, we are, there are data gaps, um, but I think that there are lots of opportunities, um, you know, for the state to um, evaluate that. And so, 
by requiring them to look at, to do a pilot, to look at TOPA and other potential test methods that get us to a better sense of both the presence of other PFAS and the amount. Um, that's something that you know we would support and we think is important. And the distinction with between A and B is that with you know we know how to quantify you know however many PFAS it is it changes and EPA is going to be updating its test method. Um, you know those are certified methods um, and we can actually quantify um, you know the num the, the PFAS that we're that um, folks that are in public water system water. Um, so your, the acronym evolved a little. I was thinking about TOP, now it's TOFA. So it's the A assay? What's the it's, A? It's assay. Yeah, I, it's TOP assay, or uh, some people refer to it as TOFA. Okay. Trying to keep up with yeah. the revolving language. <laughs> Good thing. Okay, great. Anything else? Um, the, in Section B, that same Section 6B, uh, I think that there is um, on line 12, I think the sentence should end um, PFAS detectable from standard laboratory methods, period. I think at one point there was discussion about whether or not we would list out specific PFAS, um, but because that is evolving, um, I think the, the requirement to monitor for the maximum number um, of PFAS no, from the standard. Data, so That's the right. Go reference the list, just the maximum PFAS number. With the test. That's right. Um, then the other uh, section 2B on page 3, line 9. I, because the rulemaking deadline is um, February 1st, 2020, I think that we would be okay with having a less frequent testing interval um, because there will be a rulemaking process where we'll have an opportunity to, um, to discuss what the frequency ought to be. So two years was mentioned, so you're, you want to wait for... I think that is fine because only because there is a deadline to complete the rule okay. well before that two year deadline. Um, and I think during that rulemaking process, there'll be a dialogue about what is the appropriate frequency. Got it. So I'm just trying to back up to the direction related to rulemaking to make sure that it references something like this so that we can ensure. So that we'll all agree that we should expect a rule to address this. Where's the rule making authority? Page and more, line 13, on report February 1, 2020. Thank they you. file a final proposed rule. So, As part of that rulemaking to set a maximum contaminant level, there will need to be a component of that rulemaking it will have to be a monitoring requirement. And, um, and I think that's it. Any questions? Um, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, committee, do you have any other questions on this? And anyone that you feel like we ought to hear from, that we have to engage in people? And people have been speaking to others so far, but um, as we're closing in on the final draft, let's just make sure if anyone says, oh, I have, I have this question, we haven't addressed it yet, I want to make sure that we we uh, know what the question is and, and find out from whom you'd like to hear in order to address it. So, so anything, Andy, Mr. Chapman? Uh, this is a, an observation. Um, since there's now an interim standard authority that requires testing by September 1st, 
do you want to have the date on page 7, line 10, um, requiring testing for all PFAS move to September 1st or have multiple sampling events taking place? Ideally, it Everybody probably the same I, day, right? ideally, I think having one having folks test once for everything probably makes more sense than having two dates. Okay. So the trade-off is uh, the second one is the <coughs> first round of tests. <coughs> Excuse me. You, what's your, you have a recommendation? I'm just. I, I think the recommendation is the dates ought to be consistent. I September 1st. The, I, yeah. I for the committee on as to what the actual date should be. So September 1, 2019, uh, line 9. That's what you're talking about. Not, I want to make sure. Line, line 10. 10. Page 7, line 10. Okay. So change to change July one, twenty twenty, to September first, nineteen. Thank you very much. 